moment, I'll call Mr. Gregory Campbell to move the motion and then the Minister res to respond. Uh, as is the convention for 30-minute debates, I'm afraid there won't be an opportunity for the member in charge to wind up. So I now call Mr. Gregory Campbell to move the motion. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Emerson, and it's a joy to serve under your chairmanship. Uh, the oversight of BBC commissioning is the title of the debate. I want to start, uh, Mr. Robertson, by using a number of quotes from the BBC which are directly relevant to the topic. On editorial integrity and independence, quote, the BBC is independent of outside interests and arrangements that it could undermine our editorial integrity. Our audiences should be confident that our decisions are not influenced by outside interests, political or commercial pressures, or any personal interests, end of quote. Then on fairness, they say, our output will be based on fairness, openness, honesty, and straight dealing, end of quote. And the final one on transparency, they say, we will be transparent about the nature and provenance of the content we offer online. Where appropriate, we will identify who has created the content and will use labeling to help online users make informed decision informed decisions about the suitability of content for themselves and their children. These have been burning issues at the heart of the BBC for several years, Mr. Robertson. Salaries, for example, of their highly paid employees was a closely guarded secret for a very long time. It was indefensible even if some of those employees were not questioning others who were also paid for out of the public purse. But the double standards jumped out at the viewing and listening public when they regularly probed others but hid behind BBC executive decisions when asked about their own salaries. That was gradually worn down and now it is an annual disclosure with no mass exodus of talent that the corporation had used as a defence when they resisted disclosure. Now that one issue of transparency regarding directly paid salaries has been largely resolved, we have the overlapping one of payments made by the corporation for the commissioning of contracts, particularly where contracts are awarded to private companies owned or partially owned by several BBC presenters. There is one player on the Northern Ireland commissioning pitch whose commissions have been paid millions of pounds in revenue for years. It's now nearly 10 years since the company Third Street Studios first received commissions. Third Street Studios was owned entirely by a BBC presenter, Mr Stephen Nolan, until last year, when a leading bookmaker in Northern Ireland became a person with significant influence in the company. According to the Belfast Telegraph, he said, quote, he transferred all shares in his production company to a firm solely controlled by bookmaker Paul McLean, unquote. Now, the Director General of the BBC has indicated that he's in favour of all outside interests of employees being made public. So why would monies earned by an employee who also has his or own company that bids for and gets numerous commissions for programmes not also be disclosed? The fairness issue is relevant here as a number of companies from the independent sector make excellent innovative programmes, but they find it difficult to compete when, as regularly happens, a very highly paid BBC employee not only gets commissions, but are then able to additionally advertise them on their own BBC radio programmes, which obviously puts someone from the independent sector at a disadvantage when the next round of bidding for commissioned programmes begins. Because if the BBC Insider, due to excessive advertising on their own behalf, can point to good audience figures and claim they are best positioned to get yet another contract, the independent sector is most likely to lose out. These issues have been raised by me previously. Yeah. I'll give away. Sir, can I commend my honourable friend and, and uh, uh, member for East London Dairy for bringing this forward? I've uh, at previous debates have, have brought a number of issues forward, uh, a slightly different one but nonetheless important. The, the, does the Honourable Member not agree that whilst there seems to be an unending budget for investigatory programming, programming for diversity in the forms of Ulster Scots 
programming or indeed Christian uh, shows or uh, uh, episodes have been cut back beyond recognition and a rebalance of interest <coughs> needs to take place. Does the Honourable Gentleman accept that point as well, which I brought this attention in the past? Yeah, I thank my, my colleague uh, and friend from Shrinkford for that uh, intervention. Yes, uh, indeed, there has to be diversity of a range of, of directions that the BBC get involved in. And it's equally important that when commissioning programmes of the type that he very well mentioned in his intervention, that there needs to be transparency in how they would be uh, contracted and uh, shown as well. So the issues that I have raised that, that I've alluded to regarding commissioning have been raised by me in terms of transparency in 2017 and then again in terms of commissioning in 2019. In between those deba debates, I met with senior BBC executives in both Belfast and London. I met also with the Audit Office, senior executives and Ofcom to try and ensure that matters would be thoroughly investigated. Movement either ground to a halt or moved exceptionally slowly, Mr Robertson. I get the impression that the BBC, just like the salaries escapade, mm -hmm. feel that if they can grind the process down, it will eventually go away. It didn't with salaries, and I intend to ensure that it doesn't with the commissioning of contracts. It is important that fee pay, license fee payers can see how much has been earned as well as the process and how it is discharged with the responsibility of oversight being within the ambit of the BBC. So on transparency, Mr Robertson, I understand the arguments about commercial sensitivity on contracts, but many years after a commission is broadcast, what can the commercial sensitivities possibly be? Even government has moved from a 30-year rule to a 20-year rule on publishing documentation. But the BBC still seems to live in an age where they believe we should never know how much it costs the licence fee pair to, for example, fund an outstanding series, which was The Fall. The Fall was funded in Belfast, funded in part by Invest NI and the NI Screen. Series 3 was commissioned by the controller of BBC Two. The Fall sold in over 200 countries, in the United States via Netflix, BBC Australia, Bravo Canada, DirecTV Latin America, Brazil, RT in the Republic, Fox International channels across Asia, and a multi-territory deal in Germany. This is all the hallmarks of a tremendously successful project, funded by the licence fee pair and carried out by the BBC. So why not, like any other publicly funded project, make the details available? Uh -huh. The Commission was broadcast seven years ago, and we still don't know how it was done. The simple message I have for the BBC and the government today is, where public money is used, every effort should be made in ensuring that there is integrity in the system for spending it. Secrecy leads to suspicion. If there's nothing to hide, there should be no secrecy. I come now to the declaration of interests by employees. Previously, I raised a case where a BBC journalist in Northern Ireland was involved in presenting an investigative programme which was critical of elements of policing. After the programme was aired, I discovered that it appeared the same journalist several years earlier had been a serving police officer. She had appeared in court, was bound over to be of good be behaviour, and shortly after this, left the police. This was an obvious case where the BBC executives should have taken a prior decision about the suitability of someone like this fronting a programme that was critical of policing, in inverted commas. And viewers, of course, were unaware at the time of the broadcast of the previous history of the journalist. The reason I mention that, Mr Robertson, is that there could well be similar types of issues to emerge. If commissioned programmes now, for example, were to deal with the very topical matter of addictive gambling, of Premier League football clubs, many of whom have sponsors on their shirts that are huge gambling companies, how would a conflict of interest be handled if that were to be dealt with by a company that had a controlling interest in a leading bookmaker? I come now to integrity to, to come to a close, uh, Mr Robertson. During the summer recess, I was given very disturbing 
uh, volume of internal BBC material. Some from human resources, some text messages, and they were between pr production teams. But most seriously, Mr. Robertson and I received a disturbing and alarming piece of information. The public need to have confidence in the commissioning process. Because some of those processes are worth hundreds of thousands, indeed in some cases millions of pounds. We have to have confidence in the BBC's internal processes when these are awarded. I have been given an account of a BBC internal process, an interview for a highly sought after job in the BBC Nolan production team. For context, Mr Chairman, this was a widely listened to radio show in Northern Ireland at the time, and to work on the programme was a highly prized and a much sought after position. Indeed, it's clear by the fact that a number of notable people in Northern Ireland media sector applied for the role. Only one person was successful, while at least 10 other internal as well as external candidates lost out. But Mr Robertson, the process was rigged. It wasn't fair and it lacked integrity because the unsuccessful applicants didn't lose out necessarily because they were unprepared for the interview process. They lost out because, unlike the winning candidate, the presenter did not ring them up and give them the interview questions in advance, nor were they treated to a nice meal by the presenter before the interview. Mr Chairman, this former BBC employee is prepared to come before this House and testify in committee that Stephen Nolan corrupted a BBC recruitment process by giving one applicant the interview questions in advance and coaching them on how they should answer questions. I can further inform members that in October 2018, this former employee wrote to the then BBC Northern Ireland director, a Mr Peter Johnson, and told him about this corruption of process. And he is unaware of any investigation or action. Mr Chairman, the alarming thing is that the same Mr Peter Johnson now leads the investigation into the complaints against Russell Brand here in London. This is appalling. These are not the actions of what once was a proud bastion of truth and integrity, informing, educating and entertaining without fear or favour. Truth and integrity demands a thorough investigation with government ministers telling the Director General that he needs to act and he needs to act now. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered the oversight of BBC Commissioning Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Robertson. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this morning. Um, can I begin uh, by congratulating the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for East London Derry, uh, for obtaining this debate uh, and for raising what are important matters. Um, I know that this is an issue on which he has campaigned for many years. I've read his previous debates on this subject and uh, parliamentary questions. Uh, and he has been assiduous. Uh, and in a number of areas, I have to say, I have considerable, considerable sympathy with him. Um, I've been overseeing BBC in one capacity or another for a very long time as well. Uh, and a number of the issues he raised are ones on which I too campaigned. So in particular, I would say there are three issues where we have made great progress and for which I would like to take some credit, but I also absolutely recognise his role. Uh, and they all relate to the area of commissioning. Uh, the first is the access to the BBC of the National Audit Office, uh, something which was limited in the extent to which the NAO was able to examine the BBC's uh, financial uh, accounts for quite a long time. And as he knows, the BBC argued strongly that it should not be given full access with a succession of what I regarded as somewhat spurious excuses, such as that it would somehow 
interfere with the independence from government of the BBC. Well, the BBC is independent of government, but that does not mean that the BBC shouldn't be held to account for the fact that it spends a very large amount of public money in the form of licence fee. And I'm glad that in the Charter we did uh, ensure that the NEO had full access to the BBC accounts. Uh, the second matter uh, was over the commissioning of programming. Um, it was the case previously that the BBC had an in-house production of 50% of its content. It was subject to a uh, quota for indie productions of 25%, and then there was something which was known in the, t in the trade as the WOC, which was the remaining 25% which could be opened up to either BBC in-house or uh, the independent sector. But we did reach the agreement that the BBC should move towards opening up the entire of its schedule to competition uh, from both BBC production and independent production. And the BBC is on track to achieve 100%, I think, by 2027. Uh, that has provided a huge boost to the independent production sector. It was very strongly welcomed by PACT, the body representing independent producers at the time. Um, but, of course, by opening it up, that does mean that BBC's public money through the licence fee is being used to commission programmes from uh, private companies, and obviously that needs to be done in a transparent and accountable fashion, as the Honourable Gentleman quoted is one of the requirements of the Charter. And then the third area, which also we addressed in the last Charter renewal, and which I too had campaigned, was the one which he also raised, which was the... Um, transparency of the payment of public money in the form of salaries to high-earning employees of the BBC. Uh, and I can tell him that uh, initially the BBC resisted again very strongly. They believed that it would make it harder for them to recruit, that it was somehow going to give an unfair advantage to their competitors. Um, but eventually the BBC agreed at a higher threshold than... Um, was that ultimately introduced. Uh, and actually, um, the Prime Minister who appointed me to oversee the task, David Cameron, agreed to that higher threshold. And Theresa May, when she became Prime Minister, uh, the Honourable, Right Honourable Lady for Maidenhead, insisted on bringing it back down to 150,000. Um, it has now risen in line with inflation, so I think the figure is 178,000 now for the publication of salaries. Uh, it did have, as I think he alluded to in his remarks, the unforeseen consequence. I have to say that when I, in, when I insisted on the publication of um, high salaries, uh, the individuals earning high salaries, for the reasons he give, gave, I, I did so on the basis that I thought it right that the licence fee payer should know where large amounts of licence fee pay, payers' money was going. We did not realise that it would also expose the shocking gender gap uh, between the salaries of men and women doing essentially the same jobs at the BBC. Uh, and so it had, uh, it had the consequence of making the BBC address that issue as well. And it was a very good uh, demonstration of why transparency is so important. He, he went on to talk about the way in which the BBC obviously has to publish uh, the names of those earning directly money paid as BBC employees uh, over a certain threshold, uh, but a number of people uh, obtain payment from the government through the, through the sort of intermediary of a private production company, and a number of individuals have set that up. I, I agree with him. Um, I don't think it's entirely satisfactory uh, that uh, one person who earns a large amount of money from the BBC have their name published and another doesn't just because the way in which the BBC pay them is done through a slightly different route. And I hope that is something we will continue to look at ways. Um, I raised it when I was uh, chairing the select committee and I've raised it since. Um, and I think the BBC, uh, I hope, will con continue to look at ways in which they can increase transparency, uh, which is the right way forward. Um, it was the Charter that increased the level of independent oversight of the BBC by bringing in Ofcom uh, as an independent regulator. Um, and we have a system whereby 
complaints about the BBC go first to the BBC but can then be escalated to Ofcom. Uh, the government does not get involved in that process. I think that is right, and it is for that reason that I can't directly uh, respond to some of the specific complaints that he has made. Uh, these are matters for the BBC to examine, uh, and I would agree that he has raised some important matters, which I hope that the BBC will look at, and indeed that uh, Ofcom uh, could possibly investigate as well. However, he will be aware that, as written into the Charter, uh, the government did say that there would be a review of the governance arrangements, um, and that review needs to be completed by 2024, it's called the midterm review, uh, and we will be publishing the outcome of the midterm review actually very soon now. Uh, and whilst obviously I can't reveal at this stage, I can say that one of the areas which has been raised with the government uh, a number of times, and he's done so uh, again today, is the way in which the BBC has dealt with complaints and the fact that so few have been upheld. Uh, and it is the view of the government uh, that that pr process needs to be strengthened um, and we will have more to say about how we believe it can be strengthened and the BBC has agreed that it should be strengthened when we come to publish the midterm review. I'll of course give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Robertson. I'm very grateful to the Minister, Mr Robertson, I'm grateful for his attendance and, and what he has just shared. There is a perception arising from some of the issues that my Honourable Friend has raised that there are some people within the BBC that are too popular to be criticised, that are too successful to be touched, that are too important in the ratings game to have issues raised around their conduct. And some of the issues that my honourable friend has raised this morning in this debate touch on questionable practices, if not corruptible practices, around commissioning and around individuals and their behaviour. I think the Minister is right to mention that Ofcom is there for when the BBC have uh, completed their investigations, but Ofcom looked very particularly at regulatory matters. And whilst he mentions the review that is ongoing, can he give us any assurance that there will be a level of stringent and independent oversight within the BBC and through their management structures so that when issues like this that are raised and that do touch on malpractice uh, or questionable practice around the allocation of financing and the commissioning of resources that the public, that us, that we all can have integrity in the process of when those issues are investigated. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, and I agree with him that there should be nobody uh, who is in receipt of public money or holds a senior position in a publicly owned and publicly funded organisation who should be exempt from scrutiny to make sure that they are carrying out their functions properly um, and that any concerns around that need to be investigated. Um, now, I mean, in terms of if there is anybody, you know, who is too popular or too senior to be, uh, 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 to be examined or held to account, uh, I mean, he will be aware that the highest paid employee of the BBC is Gary Lineker, over, over whom there has been quite a lot of controversy over some of his remarks. Um, and that is something which is absolutely right. And the BBC, as a consequence, have recently uh, carried out a further uh, consideration of their social media guidelines for highly paid staff and have brought those into play, uh, partially as a result of some of those controversies. Now, that's a very different matter to the kind of uh, issues which the Honourable Gentleman is raising, which are, are relating to, uh, in his words, the possibility or, or uh, um, certainly allegations have been received about possible corrupt behaviour, and that obviously would also need to be investigated. Um, and the particular show which he refers to is presented by the fourth highest paid person uh, on the BBC. But you know, that, again, is another reason why a large amount of public money is spent, and we need to be satisfied. Now, I would suggest to him, as I said, this is not a matter which the government... Um, can or should investigate, but there are independent bodies that, to do so. The first port of call, who I would uh, suggest that the Honourable Gentleman uh, might uh, talk to, as it were, um, is the BBC board member for Northern Ireland. Um, very recently appointed, Mr Michael Smythe um, has taken up post, and I'm sure you know, part of his 
part of his role is to uh, oversee the BBC's activities in Northern Ireland as well as to um, act as a member of the board as a whole. Uh, and therefore, certainly, I th I, you know, I'm sure he will draw his concerns to his attention uh, and also take advantage of the BBC First uh, complaints process. I hear what he says about the individual uh, who runs the editorial standards and guidelines committee, but there are independent board members who sit on that committee as well, uh, and so he could certainly draw his concerns to them. And then ultimately, as we have discussed, as a result of the charter, the NAO has full access, and if there are if there are concerns about the way in which public money has been spent, uh, then that too is a matter which the NAO could investigate. So I don't in any way suggest that the Honourable Gentleman hasn't raised some serious concerns. I do hope that they will be examined to his satisfaction, um, and I think he is best placed to pursue those issues through the routes that I have suggested. But I'm grateful to him for raising the, these matters this morning. The question is that this House has considered the oversight of BBC commissioning. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. The sitting is suspended until 2.30 p.m. Thank you. Well done.